fundraisers journeying through their own truth as well and what they want their own output to be is a is a pretty beautiful thing, right? When they get clear on, it's not that I can't do the work, maybe it's I can't do the work for this mission or it's not the mission, but it's the fact that I really don't want to also do the communications. And if we can't find a budget for a graphic designer, then that means I need to go to an environment where there is a communications department. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to be here today. This feels very long overdue with April Walker. April, welcome to What the Fundraising. Hi, thank you for having me. Yes, we've been planning this for a, a year. I'm just, <laughs> won't, I won't say it's your fault, but... Mm. It's definitely my fault. It's definitely my fault. Uh, it's been a long year, but I am, I'm so excited to be talking today. Why don't we start? I feel like you're somebody who needs no introduction, but I'm going to let you start by just telling everyone a little bit about you, what brings you to our conversation, and then we'll dive in. Happy to. So April Walker, founder and CEO of Philanthropy for the People, which is crazy to me because, you know, I'm very reflective time of year. Just a few years ago, this whole business of mine didn't exist, but I launched my business um, really as a result of what I was experiencing in the nonprofit sector, both on the fundraising and actually on the grant making side. So I got my start as a grant maker, which is very non-traditional. I did some consulting, some philanthropic advising and found my way to fundraising towards the latter portion of my nonprofit career. And now I get to work with various nonprofits and foundations and other philanthropy adjacent businesses in service to all things racial equity and social justice and making all of our good intentions when it comes to DEI much more actionable. Okay, can we just dive into that last sentence and sort of start there? What what do you see as the biggest disconnect between our intentions and actions? And what are some of the primary ways that shows up with fundraisers and fundraising in particular? So maybe I'll take it as two questions. Um, The disconnect with our intentions and our actual impact or output is partly (laughs) the fault of the DEI sector of old. I don't really, you know, blame practitioners because that's really all that was allowed. You come in for a day training or you do a three hour training on DEI and then you send people off to, to do what? It's this big question mark. But largely, we have so many terms, we have so much jargon that we've moved to a world in which we're not actually saying what we mean. We're not being direct or clear with our values. And we're also not seeking out a value alignment with anyone that we're engaged with. We just think if we say equity and justice and accessibility, then we're going to find our people. But that's not really the core of what we mean. And then your second point, I think, was specific to fundraising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It shows up in (laughs) in myriad ways. Um, Oh boy, you know, namely in 2020 when everyone felt obligated or like they wanted to put a statement out, but I'm hard pressed to find development departments that have changed a ton in terms of their donor relations or donor engagement. There are some, shout out to my clients that are doing the work, But by and large, it's really like you have this school of thought about how we could do this business of fundraising differently. And then you have the day-to-day realities of how you engage with your donors and your board. Okay. So, you know, one of the things I had messaged you before we jumped on that I think about a lot is like how to design habits for fundraisers and how to teach fundraisers how to design their own habits. Because for me, habit design has been a really helpful tool around anything in my life where I'm experiencing a lot of resistance, right? And fundraising really naturally creates resistance and dysregulation. And it's a very vulnerable, scary thing to do. And so I have found habit design and using that framework I studied under Dr. BJ Fogg to be really helpful to sort of get me over the action line when I'm feeling that resistance. And when I was thinking about our conversation today, I was thinking about like the blind spots that I likely have. I mean, I really believe in people designing their own habits, but I also teach things where I'm like, okay, use this inside your fundraising department. And it sort of struck me today that I'm likely not thinking about that with the right like equity lens over and integrated into sort of how I think about that framework. And so I'm just curious, like even just hearing me say that, what are some of the first things that sort of come to your mind around like, yeah, like we are sort of like mass suggesting strategies in this sector that don't work for, aren't appropriate for, aren't inclusive of everybody in those departments. I love this. And I I love your mind, which is why I'm here now. Um, but thinking about fundraisers and just sort of the different experiences that, that we bring, I'll speak in part from my own lived experience as a chief development officer, and also just as I see the sector now, 
the ways in which nonprofits engage with their development departments, if they do at all, is just so out of whack, right? It, it's no wonder we've always had this 18 month turnover for development positions, even, you know, some of those higher positions, because it's it's so unrealistic. You know, you have nonprofits that expect you to bring a pipeline with you. You have nonprofits that expect you to build a pipeline by yourself. You have other organizations that want you to be marketing, fundraising, strategy, and administration all in one role for seventy thousand dollars. It's it's ridiculous. It's absurd. So we're not really entering this work with a clear understanding of what it means to be a fundraiser or to be a frontline fundraiser at that. Um, not to mention the lack of a human resources department that many nonprofits do not have. We should talk more about that. So stick a pen in it. But as I think of my own lived experience as a chief development officer, my resistance looked very different than my colleagues, who at the time were three middle-aged white women from various Ohio suburbs. And I am not a middle-aged white woman from Ohio at all. If you're just listening, I am proudly a Black American from the East Coast at that. So you already have a different sort of cultural bend. Rest can be resistance for us. Silence can be resistance. Choosing to not educate making everything not a teachable moment that falls on my shoulders. Disengaging, quite frankly, can be resistance when you know that you are going to be looked at when someone brings up anything about DEI. And if it's not in your job description, I'm not going to do it. Letting people fumble and learn from their mistakes. Resistance is also actually doing some of the work, but being so mindful of that additional labor. Um, I know there was a report that came out a few years ago about the lived experiences of people of color in development. Maybe it was cause effective that put it out. And it talked about how many of us come from predominantly white environments, which really means that we've grown up and we've navigated academic or professional careers, knowing how to keep and make white people comfortable. That in and of itself is a learned behavior that we can turn on and off. You also enter environments expecting to not get that same comfort in return, right? So what are the habits that I need to bring forth to keep myself healthy and well, to keep myself grounded in my own authentic truth while I'm doing this work. I may have ventured from your question, friend, but that's where it took me. <laughs> no, I, you know, I so appreciate that. And I, gosh, there's like this, I mean, this is why all of the like individual work is also the systemic work, right? Because it's like, we can only talk about or suggest strategies, like I do a lot of work around like nervous system regulation, right? Because when we're in a chronic stress state, it's impossible for us to connect. And as fundraisers, we are constantly told, build authentic connections, be vulnerable. And it's like, okay, well, when our stress response is like, you are unsafe, you cannot, you biologically cannot connect. And what creates safety for one person does not create safety for another person. And so how we like, while there might be somatic tools that could be beneficial to me and you at like, we're not having the same, we're not in the same environment, even if it looks like it's the same environment in which to practice those tools. Yeah. How do you, how do you think about that or, or think about like how teams need to be honest about that. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I love how it's an intersection of all of your work. I was thinking in preparation for this conversation about the ways in which my fundraising acumen or my fundraising approach really mirrors how I'm doing in my own life. Namely, I am someone that most folks would describe as strong and independent and a go-getter that also means I struggle, at least for me, to ask for help. Um, so as a fundraiser, there have certainly been seasons of my career where I just have not asked donors because I don't want to be asking for help. There are some caveats with that in terms of being inside of authentic relationships already means a lot of those people would say, hey, April, what do you need? <laughs> anyway, so we were still able to have this ongoing conversation, but it took a while to get there. Um, but I definitely know other times I've been hemmed up by just the, the performative nature of wanting to make sure I have everything right. So then I can't really look like I'm struggling. I can't look like there is a, a void in the pipeline when truly it's just a big old black hole. <laughs> like I can't look like our development committee meeting doesn't have a structure when in reality I've just convened some very 
wealthy, <laughs> charitable folks that aren't helping me in the day-to-day -day operations. So then how do I then turn that off and go to a donor and say, hey, here's the true reality of what's happening at this organization. And in my consulting work, and certainly towards the end of my you know, chief development officer tenure, I just became so mindful of culture, which is why I named my business what I did, Philanthropy for the People, because the people aren't all right in nonprofits. And if fundraising isn't, if fundraising is not in service to that, then I really don't know what it's doing. You know, come into an environment every day where folks are underpaid, where they're living out the consequences of that and bringing that to work with them, where there's cr like cruel hierarchy sometimes, where there's no trust, where there's really poor delegation. Like the mission might be great, but this environment really sucks. And so that turned my attention to I, I got to approach it differently. Like <laughs> the people are not okay. And if you get into a healthy environment, that tends to be like a surprise for a lot of folks in this nonprofit world, all those conversations we're having offline. Yeah. I mean, how, okay. So when you're like knowing that this is true about the environment that we're operating in, and also knowing that we want to support the enablement of fundraisers to operate in those environments, but then also to be able to to your point, like emotionally protect themselves from being in an unsafe environment. Like what is, what is that dance? Like how do we, you know, I I'll be honest, like there have been moments in, in my career in the last few years where I'm like, okay, like I am teaching these fundraisers, like how to be more vulnerable. What if that makes them less safe? Like what if that exposes them to something that then is really painful? Like, did I do that? Like, is that, is that, should I be doing that? And I, and I just feel like this, but then of course I want fundraisers to have the tools to be able to, and the conscious choice to be able to show up how they want to show up in a moment and to, and to make that choice. How do you think about that balance? That's such a good question. That's such a good question, right? Because it's almost like we know the mechanics of how this works. We also know I'll speak really some of us, we know how those best practices do not apply to nonprofits of different shape and sizes, with different resources, without endowment, whatever, right? Um, so support for fundraisers needs to take all of that into account. That support should be coming from myriad ways. I see way too many organizations that do not take a collective or collaborative approach to lifting up development, not as experts, but really as facilitators and educators, right? If you're in development, that by, that probably means you don't want to be on the programmatic side. That may not be your strength. And you're either not on, you know, in the leadership realm or something else because you want to be facilitating and moving money in the direction of good. We need to understand the work to do that. And we need to be able to connect with the community to do that. If you don't have a CEO support in expressing to your, your colleagues why they should get back to you, like how they can come along in the grant application and report process, then you're always going to look like you're nagging. <laughs> it's always going to be a transactional relationship. So it really starts from the inside. <laughs> why don't we have mandatory weeks off after fundraisers plan big events? Like, <laughs> why don't we just give all of us a break? So many people are quick to say, oh, I could never fundraise or I would hate to fundraise. And then when it comes to like actually supporting fundraisers, they don't want to acknowledge or hold that truth with what it deserves, right? You have people on your development committee who will be like, well, I don't want to fundraise, but I'll maybe give you an introduction to so-and-so. Cool. You're, you're still sending me out there to take a big risk. And regardless of my capacity to hear no's or turn no's and to not yet's and not now's, it, it would be nice if folks invested a bit more in the cycles that we're in inside of various donor relationships, inside of systems and structures we can't change inside of funder relationships with very outsized expectations. Um, but like you, I definitely, I struggle because clients will approach me and say they want one thing. And in reality, they're not actually interested in changing. So it's been interesting to navigate that. Like in terms of the culture that support, they're like, we want fundraisers to be able to do X. And it's like, okay, well, in order for them to do X, they need to be in an environment that supports blank, blank, blank. And it's like, well, we don't want to, we don't want them to do X that badly, or we want them to be able to do X without me doing that part of it. Correct. Like we want, you know, community centric fundraising, because that's, that's the word that we heard of late that we should be using, but I'm only going to bring development to your training. It's not going to be program staff. What can I do with that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> these, these good people 
well know and relate to what I'm saying. It may be cathartic for them. It's not going to change how you operate internally. This also is a community, right? Yeah. Okay. Wow. I knew we would get into the meat so quickly, (laughs) you and I, Um, because, you know, I'm wondering, like, when you support fundraisers to think about building authentic relationships or being in connection with donors, what are some of the, maybe you use the term habits or maybe you don't, but like, what are some of the ways that you suggest they start to build those relationships that help them both like stay sort of safe in, in their bodies, in those relationships, but also help advance them forward? I don't know. I think at this point in my journey, I've attracted a lot of people that speak my language, thank goodness. But I do understand the genesis of your question in that I I know a lot of fundraisers need a safe space to just say the thing, right? To be like, this, whatever, is ridiculous, is painful. Also, I've done a few you know presentations this year where I've asked folks in the room to raise their hand if they've experienced any type of harassment on the job. And naturally, we have a lot of women, occasionally some men raising their hand. So holding space for those realities, especially in environments where they can't take that information to anyone else, or they, they don't feel safe enough to say, say that to their ED or their CEO, and there is no HR. So I do consider that safety that you talked about previously in terms of you know, we we want to offer them the best strategy, but is it a, the safe thing for them to do? Fundraisers journeying through their own truth as well and what they want their own output to be is a is a pretty beautiful thing, right? When they get clear on, it's not that I can't do the work, maybe it's I can't do the work for this mission, or it's not the mission, but it's the fact that I really don't want to also do the communications. And if we can't find a budget for a graphic designer, And that means I need to go to an environment where there is a communications department. So really being able to sort of structure and figure out what their strengths are, what part of these development functions that at the end of the day brings them joy. And then inside of those specific relationships where they are showing up authentically, I like to measure energy. And I imagine you relate because you're a nervous system kind of gal. But even when I put my foundation list or pipeline in order, when I put my development conversations in order, like where is where what's energizing and what is depleting and balancing it that way it's it's something i also brought from the foundation and grant making world because at the end of the day you still have to call folks and say hey you're not getting funded so then how do you navigate those conversations do you get your no's out of the way first do you get your yeses out of the way first do you mix it up but for me it's the energy it's just figuring out which donors do you feel are also bringing you the sincerity that you're bringing them Where are you still trying to build a path to a relationship? These are all different hacks that we have to account for subconsciously. Um, So bringing some of that to the forefront. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. Like when I think about like habit and behavior design in particular, some of what you're talking about is like, well, energy, we could talk about totally separately too, because I, my certification as an executive coach is in energy leadership. So it's like all about kind of figuring, figuring that piece out that that's a whole other conversation. But I, I love thinking about this in relation to habits too, because I think we think about habits like, like it's something we can like detach from ourselves, Mm, right? We're like, mm -hmm. oh, I can just do this thing every day. And one of the things that I've learned so much in my habit work is that habits get cemented through emotion. And how, and our ability and to do habits is related directly to emotion. And so we are trying, like in some ways we tell fundraisers, you know, do it for the mission, overwork for the mission, take low pay for the mission, right? Like leave it all on the field for the mission. And then we're like, oh, they said, no, don't take it personally. (laughs) It's like, like, wait, wait, I thought, I thought you just wanted me to take everything personally. Absolutely. And fully invest. Yes, until now when it's inconvenient to support my emotions around how personal it feels. And so part of what I'm like hearing in in what you're saying is like this need to like create and hold space for the emotions that come with fundraising, the good, the bad. If we want our fundraisers to get back out there after they hear a no, like we have to support the emotions that come with that no and not just say, oh, don't feel, don't feel that way. Or it's not personal, you know? And it's like, yeah, maybe it's not personal, but it sure as hell feels personal. And so I, yeah, I really appreciate those points. I remember working with an ED who... (laughs) 
Woo! said to me, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to sell it. It's clearly is like a, a Mallory and April conversation for After Dark, right? But I, I, I won't be celebrating any wins until we reach the goal. And I was immediately like, I didn't even know this was going to, I was like, that won't work for me. I was like, that won't work for me. I know you want to get to whatever, however many million, but if I bring you a $50,000 check, I need some type of affirmation. Well, you know, I left and they never reached the goal. And, and there you go. Because how demotivating is it and uninspiring to raise money and do the work to raise money to not be supported in that, right? You don't get to however many million without getting 50,000 or 100,000 over three years. Like, spare me. Yeah. Okay. What is that? Because I I mean, all the science supports exactly the opposite also. Like celebration is such an important part of motivation. It's an important part of habit solidification. We talk about it with BJ's model. It's called shine, right? And, And he wants you to be doing it for everything, for picking up the phone, even before you press those numbers and call the donor. That's how the science of behavior demonstrates we do these hard things. What do you think that is that makes us, because I, I have a feeling that is a common, It it's not always said out loud, but that is a common behavior in our sector. What What is that? Oh, I have my ideas. And I distinctly know <laughs> in that situation, in that situation, it's because leadership was carrying an untruth through the entire fundraising effort right? In terms of their clarity on what these funds are going to be used for. And then in terms of how they presented that lack of clarity to the board, needing their investment and buy-in. And so you that pressure, I imagine she was feeling to, I have to win this for my own personal you know, glory, but also because so many people have said that we can't. Well, then pause and figure out how you got here in the first place, right? If we're not clear on what we're doing, we shouldn't be doing anything. You know why? Because no fundraiser really likes to sell a lie. That's some of the times I've seen fundraisers get the most heated and rightfully so because I have my own story. If you put me through, <laughs> if I've gone through the motions of raising money for something you never had an intention to do, you never followed through on, you were going to make feel like it was a burden once we got the money. I could I could just walk out on that alone. Like, you know what? Because we're facilitating dialogue between all these parties to the best of our ability. And at the end of the day, you just want a money you could turn into some type of whatever. Yeah. Oh, oh God, we have all been there. <laughs> we have all been there. I yes. know. And then and then you want me to go back and ask for more money from that same person after you just did that? I mean, oh, oh it hurts my heart. Um, the audacity. But, yeah. Yeah, but we've all been there. And but you know what you said something I really want to double click on too, which is that like dysregulated people dysregulate people. You know, and like that is like such a important piece of this sector because there's so much like and I hate this word but I'm going to use it and it described me to the T as a leader for many years, which is like there's like this martyrdom of like, I've suffered, I am suffering. And so now the culture is suffering because if I have to suffer, you know, and for executive directors, this like impossible role where you're isolated in between a board and staff and I, and you're so unappreciated everybody. So then it's like, you don't appreciate other people. And it just creates these like cycles of like, you're not feeling celebrated. So you don't celebrate others. And, and this is where I think like, sometimes it does take some individuals and it, and that was the case for me of like, kind of waking up and be like, whoa, like I'm perpetuating the very things that are hurting me and so painful for me because that's what's being modeled to me because I don't know any different. Um, And so that's why I'm so grateful for the work that you do and for conversations like this, be like, okay, there are hugely important systemic things that we should need to be addressing. And there are individual things that we can do and we need to like row together in both of those tracks. A thousand percent. And for your listeners, I hope they don't take away that it's all doom and gloom, right? It's all bad. I think we have to have a number of things be true at once. There are some organizations that have paid lip service to change and don't really intend to. There are others that actually truly have shaken things up and are living in the reality of what that means. There are others that have tried and failed, others that have yet to start. And so I think my access and probably your access to deceive different folks on different variations and parts of this journey still is really inspiring having hard conversations that do not feel good, diversifying boards in ways that make people really uncomfortable 
And then we're figuring out that that discomfort is not an excuse for inaction. It's not an excuse to keep trying. It's not an excuse to figure it out, um, but that it's a part of the work. Yeah, we're asking you to do something that hasn't that you've not done before. So much like you, you should be uncomfortable. We have not done this before. And even with, you know, with foundation partners, I, I can't say that I actually miss being a program officer for various reasons, but I appreciate folks that I can just talk, let's talk about the mechanics of this. At, at the end of the day, you're not actually the, the decision maker. You know what I mean? You're a conduit, just like I'm a conduit. Let's talk mechanics. When do you want the grant? What's the best time to submit it? What's the board talking about right now? Have any of the decision makers changed? That'll take me 12, 15 minutes. Spend the rest of this time talking about mission work in the context of what you're doing. That's it. Spare me. <laughs> Everything else. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, gosh, it's such an important point. And I think it's such a, like a reason why all of these conversations are so critical for people to be having and to be able to do some of that introspective introspection, but also knowing that like, it doesn't all fall on their shoulders. And it isn't all their responsibility to fix all the all the pieces for everybody at once, because that's the other fear I have, right? It's just it becomes this other to do for fundraisers mm-hmm. to then fix this system that they're that they're, you know, trying to navigate through. Um, and so I'm, I'm really grateful for you. And I'm really grateful for the work that you do. Likewise, I'm so glad this is finally happening. <laughs> I will no longer <laughs> make jokes too. about how long it took, but you have a very <laughs> cute reason as to why, you know, she's the kind of the best excuse. Uh, understandably so. Uh, where can people go to learn more about you and your work and any final things you want to leave folks with? Yeah, you can follow me on LinkedIn under Philanthropy for the People or April C. Walker. Instagram is the same as the other place, and I'm pretty active, Philanthropy for the People. I don't do Twitter or <laughs> much on threads. So <laughs> LinkedIn, Instagram, or my website, philanthropyforthepeople.com. Um, definitely reach out if you want to chat or if you have some something I can maybe partner with you on. Parting words would just be to take really gentle care of yourself there are not enough environments or are not enough relationships that handle us with the gentleness that we we deserve and we really need. Um, so that probably would be my, my, my closing point. I love that. I love that. And y'all are going to be hearing this at near the start of 2024. And I feel like one of my words for 2024 is ease. I think about that in that gentle, that gentleness. I love to work hard. I love to do interesting things, but I want there to be an, an ease and a gentleness to my relationships, to the work that I do. And gosh, do we need that more than ever. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm very happy to be here.